Welcome to Buried Secrets, a podcast about the paranormal, the occult, and weird and forgotten history. I'm Chris. This episode is a continuation of the series that I've been doing about Fordham University, which is a Catholic Jesuit university in the Bronx. It's where I went to school, so I have some weird stories about my time there. And I also have always been interested in the urban legends and ghost stories about Fordham University. So last time I talked about Finley Hall, which used to be the medical school building for Fordham University back when it had a medical school. And then when the med school was closed, it became a chemistry building. And then eventually it became a dorm in the 1980s. And I lived in that dorm in the 2000s. And I've talked a decent amount about how I don't really like this building. I found it deeply creepy to live in. And even as someone who's really interested in the paranormal, I get this feeling of dread even thinking about my time there. And that's what this whole episode is going to be about. I want to talk about a few unusual things that happened to me while I was living there in Finley Hall. So I've been thinking a lot about how to present the personal stories in this episode, and that in part is because I've been thinking about sort of some philosophical underpinnings that have to do with how we talk and think about the paranormal. So in my usual roundabout way, I want to talk a little bit about that because that will bring us into the way I want to talk about my experiences at Finley. So what got me thinking about all of this is this podcast that I listen to. It's a really popular podcast about conspiracy theories, but in particular about the QAnon conspiracy theory. And the podcast is called QAnon Anonymous. It's very, very popular. And it's really fascinating, you know, if you're willing to be a little bit demoralized and depressed at times. But they really do a deep dive into... In particular, the QAnon conspiracy theory, but on their Patreon, they do a lot of episodes about other things, kind of things that are tangentially related to conspiracy theories and conspiratorial thinking. And they've done a lot of episodes about paranormal topics. So, for example, they have talked about Atlantis and the Mothman and Ed and Lorraine Warren and all sorts of topics that I've heard covered many, many times on paranormal podcasts and, you know, paranormal YouTube, etc. And it's been really, really interesting for me to listen to it from the perspective of folks who look at conspiracy theories as a job. And, you know, at first, as someone who's into the paranormal and believes in the paranormal, I had a little bit of like an instinctual bristling when I started listening to these episodes. Because while the episodes are really good and well done, they have a really different point of view than a paranormal podcast would when looking at paranormal topics. And one thing that really struck me is that the way that we tend to think in the paranormal, which is looking for patterns, following our feelings, connecting disparate but potentially linked things, searching for hidden knowledge, that has a lot in common with the way that conspiracy theorists view reality. That being said, I obviously believe in paranormal phenomena, and I don't think that all conspiracy theories are false. So I'm not trying to paint folks who are interested in the paranormal with the same brush as someone who believes in something like the QAnon conspiracy theory, for example. But I think it's always good to have a reminder that it's really, really important to use critical thinking when talking about the paranormal. I mean, obviously that's a big part of what I'm doing with this podcast and why this Fordham series is so darn long, because I'm really trying to dive into the paranormal stories and urban legends and sift through what sort of supporting information, et cetera, I can find about them. You know, what can I disprove? What can I prove? Et cetera. But I wanted to take this time to explicitly say all of this and say why I look at the paranormal from such an analytical and non-dogmatic point of view because I think it's really important to take any source about the paranormal with a grain of salt. And that includes you listening to me, right? I never want you to believe that an experience is paranormal just because I said it is. 
or because I said I think it is or might be. And I've been trying to tease out how this works philosophically. So take, for example, my experiences in Finley Hall. I genuinely believe that I was experiencing something paranormal in Finley Hall, and I don't really imagine being able to come across something that would convince me otherwise for all three of the things that I'm going to talk about. I sometimes feel less sure about some of my other paranormal experiences, but my experiences in Finley Hall, to me, feel solid and real, and that's just a feeling that I have. Of course, I'm going to present everything that I experienced and the research I've done. I'm going to try to debunk everything I'm talking about as well, because I think it is important to look at everything from all points of view, but I think it's real. However, like I said, I really don't want you to just take my word for it, or rather, I'd of course be happy if you thought that I experienced something paranormal, but... As always, I would never blame someone for disagreeing or saying that sounds like BS, etc. To me, the worst case scenario coming out of this is for people to believe something that I said just because I said it, right? I think that even if something comes from a trusted source, every claim that someone makes should be assessed. And, you know, it's kind of up to everyone to really do that thinking And just, you know, as they decide what they want to believe, what they don't, etc. So if you believe me in this episode or any other, I hope that that's because when I've talked about something, I've, you know, examined it from all the different angles and I looked at the possible debunkings and complicating factors. And I hope that once I've done all of that and you've thought through it all, you came to either a logical or maybe even an emotional or intuitive conclusion about whether you think that it's something paranormal or something ordinary, or if you just aren't sure. And it's true that in the paranormal, not everything is logical and rational. In fact, I'd say many things aren't, if not most things. And it's normal to come to conclusions based on a more emotional or intuitive sense, and that's okay. But I just want to take this time to caution you against believing things just because someone you like or trust said it. And please do periodic reality checks. In the paranormal, it's common, and I think fine, to make some weird connections and follow synchronicities. But if you start to find yourself doing that in the mundane areas of your life, and if it's kind of starting to affect a lot of the things that you do on the non-paranormal parts of your life, you know, you might want to pull back and question some things, think more deeply on them, etc. And I know this is a digression, but listening to stories about the paranormal from that other lens was really a little bit of a wake up call for me, not in terms of me doubting anything that I'm doing or saying, but more in me recognizing that you can build a habit of looking for connections between things in sort of harmless parts of the paranormal, and you can lead people to build that habit as well. But that stops being okay if it spreads to other parts of life and potentially becomes harmful or causes people to believe things that could lead to harm, etc. And I don't think that I tend in general toward conspiratorial thinking, though of course I think I have a very healthy dose of skepticism towards authority figures, etc. But I certainly could see how unhealthy conspiratorial thinking could grow out of perfectly harmless paranormal analysis or like paranormal thinking. And for me, I'm trying to find a way to separate the great habits that I have developed doing paranormal research, you know, this sense of wonder, feeling like the world has hidden messages and meanings, feeling like, you know, there's something enchanting and animating the world, And I'm trying to make sure that doesn't seep into other areas of my life or belief system, etc., in a way that could be harmful or cause problems. And I just want to encourage everyone to, as you engage with the paranormal, always keep this in mind. So with that out of the way, let's get back into Finley Hall and my experiences there. And like I said, I've really struggled with how personal to get in this episode because there were some things that were going on in my personal life that I do think had a bearing on my feelings about Finley Hall. And 
which may have even influenced to some degree my experience of the place as being full of dread and ominous intent. And for me, I don't even think it's like I had an unpleasant time living there and that made me imagine paranormal things. Like, I think it's very possible that I was in such a dark and bad place that I was more likely to attract something negative or maybe something negative contributed to me being in a bad and dark space and it kind of spiraled out from there. I don't totally know, but I do think it's worth knowing when a set of paranormal stories are also linked with someone having a very bad time in life, just because I think that's valuable. It's like a valuable data point to have when looking at the paranormal in general and, you know, a set of stories in particular. So I'll try not to go into too much detail here, but I think here's what you should know about what was going on in my life at the time. So I was a sophomore in college. I think I've mentioned this before, but I was very sick when I was living in Finley Hall. So while I was living there in the fall, swine flu hit universities in the United States and tons and tons of people were getting sick. And already in college, you know, I was the typical student who was not doing the most healthy things, right? Like I didn't have the most healthy habits in terms of like sleeping, eating, partying too much, etc. So I do think that I got swine flu and I also think that I was extremely run down. And that happened while I was living in Finley Hall. And that caused a recurrence of mono because I had had mono in the past and I'm pretty sure that I got it again. And that is a thing that can happen. Like I know other people who've gotten mono more than once because it never really leaves your system. And if you are really stressed or physically overtaxed, et cetera, it can come back, you know, if your immune system is compromised. So I was very sick when I lived there. And a lot of my memories of that place are kind of, you know, seen through this unpleasant, feverish, and very gothic haze of illness, at least in my, you know, mind's eye. So that's one thing. And then there were a few other things going on. So I mentioned in the last episode, Finley Hall is set up so that most of the rooms are three-person rooms. Two roommates live on the downstairs of the room. Then there's a spiral staircase with a loft in the top, you know, uh, top area of the room. And I mentioned this last time, but the room that I lived in, and I think many rooms in that building, the room was arranged so that I couldn't tell if my roommate who lived in the loft was up there or not. Like I look up and you just couldn't see her because there was stuff blocking that line of sight. But as I later discovered, she could see and hear everything that my other roommate and I were doing in the downstairs. So she could see our computer screen, she could hear our conversations, etc. So there was this feeling of always being surveilled. And there did end up being a little bit of a bad situation with that roommate who lived in the loft. She was doing some pretty creepy stuff that included eavesdropping on me passing off things that I had said to our other roommate as her own ideas in class, starting to dress like me. It was very creepy and weird. And I'm not going to go into more detail than that. But the whole time, not only was I very sick, but I had the sense that this person who had ill will towards me was always surveilling me and watching me. So th when thinking about the paranormal, you know, there's often this feeling of being watched, et cetera. And I always had the feeling that someone was watching me in that building. And I think some of it was my creepy roommate, but I felt that way in other parts of the building when I was alone, et cetera. So I just think that that heightened any kind of feeling of anxiety and feelings of being watched that I might've had at the time. And then the other really important thing to know is that at the time I was closeted because I did not feel safe coming out at Fordham. Hopefully stuff has gotten better at Fordham since I've been there, you know, since the 2000s, but I don't really know. I did find a 2016 article in the Fordham Ram, which is the student newspaper, about how some roommates in Finley Hall who were all queer got a homophobic comment written in Sharpie on their door. 
you know, on their whiteboard that was out on their door in the hallway. So I don't have super high hopes for what it is like these days, at least as of 2016. People were still extremely homophobic. And when I was there, the atmosphere was extremely, extremely homophobic. Not so much from the professors, but definitely from the other students. That being said, I've known a number of people who have come out after graduating, so that's not to say that there's no queer people at Fordham or that everyone is intolerant. That's definitely not the case. But there was this oppressive feeling of intolerance, and people would say things that were not good. So there was that. And then also, of course, on top of it, there was a girl I liked, but I couldn't ask her out without coming out. So I was doing a lot of kind of pathetic, silent pining. And of course, as you might guess, I was also just very depressed in general between all the stuff that was going on. I was in really bad shape when living in Finley Hall. So to me, I think that whole situation was a perfect storm for weird paranormal stuff. College is already this really liminal time. But, you know, all of the different things in my life that were not great at the time heightened that feeling of negativity and just the sense that there was this malevolent presence or intent there in that building. So with all that table setting out of the way, let's get into the weird stuff I experienced in Finley. So I mentioned last time that Finley Hall is right next to a entrance to campus. It was supposedly placed there to make it easier to subtly transport cadavers from off campus onto campus to be dissected in Finley Hall back when Finley was still the medical school building. I mentioned this last time, you know, there was an operating theater in the building. There were what I believe may have been areas where cadavers were stored in the basement. Like there were a lot of, there there was at least one, but I I remember there being several, I think. Um, But there were some tall, narrow doors that always seemed to me like the perfect size for, you know, drawers, you know, pull out shelves to keep bodies, etc. Could be wrong about that, but I always got that sense that cadavers were potentially stored in the basement. And I've read sources including on the university library website that confirm that cadavers were kept in the basement. So creepy place. But back when I was a student, Finley Hall's proximity to the edge of campus made it ideal for students who lived off campus to bring their laundry to the building to do it there. Laundry was included in room and board for people who lived on campus. So sneaking into Finley was basically like a way for students living off campus to get free laundry. And the university, unsurprisingly, didn't like that people were doing that. So even though from my point of view, it wasn't an issue, it didn't cause residents any issues, the university decided that they were going to require that the laundry room, which was in the basement, and which was very creepy, be closed and locked at all times. Like you actually had to use your key to get into the building. You had to use that key to get into the laundry room. And that didn't prevent people from off campus, from doing their laundry there. I had a friend who I still let in. I would just, you know, unlock the door for him so he could get into the laundry room and do his laundry there. So students were still doing that, who lived off campus. But of course, it did have the effect of making the already creepy basement just a little bit creepier because the door to the laundry room was very sturdy and very heavy. And having it closed and locked the whole time I was in the laundry room, really weirded me out whenever I was doing my laundry. You know, think about it. You're down there in this creepy basement, which incidentally didn't have cell service, doing laundry in a room next to areas where cadavers used to be stored. You know, there's an entrance to Fordham's tunnel system nearby in the basement. So it was just generally an uneasy place to be. Also, the machines were industrial washers and dryers, so they were really loud. And I always felt like someone could easily sneak up on me or something without me noticing. But, and this is kind of weird, the university apparently had thought of that because in the corner of the room, there was one of those big round mirrors that you usually see positioned around tight corners in the subway or in bike paths or by ATMs or whatever. You know, this mirror that basically acts like a fisheye 
lens or fisheye mirror so that no one can sneak up on you from any direction because you can see it all in the mirror at once. Why on earth did a laundry room need that? I have no idea. And I never felt great about it being there. Like, it just felt weird. For the record, I can't remember if any of the other laundry rooms at Fordham had those mirrors. I can only remember the Finley one. But I don't know. I can't think of any good explanation for that mirror being down there. And it always felt to me like I should be even more worried about being in this creepy laundry room. You know, what did the university think was going to happen down there? So one afternoon I was doing my laundry. I was in there alone and I felt kind of uneasy and unsettled. So I was rushing a little bit as I put a load into the washer and I you know, chose the cycle and started it. And I remember feeling so relieved as soon as I started the wash. I was like, I can get out of here. It was an unusual amount of relieved. And I was just so happy that I could get the heck out of there, go back upstairs to my room. And right before I hurried out of there, I had this thought, thank God I can get out of here. It would have been terrible if I had selected the wrong cycle and then had to stand there and advance the cycle to fix it. Because the weird thing with these washers was you couldn't just switch cycles once it started. You had to do this whole rigmarole to advance the cycle and then restart the machine. And it wasn't hugely time consuming, but it was kind of a pain. And just as I was thinking that, I looked at the washer and I saw that I had, in fact, accidentally chosen the wrong cycle, which was weird. That wasn't something that I usually did. So it was kind of weird for me to think, wow, I'm glad I didn't choose the wrong cycle. And then for me to have chosen the wrong cycle, though maybe, you know, subconsciously I had noticed that I chose the wrong cycle, but I was in such a hurry that I didn't notice it, whatever. And I had chosen the really hot setting, which... I knew would damage my clothes if I left it in. I had had a problem with my clothes shrinking in the wash a lot at Fordham, jeans in particular, which of course are relatively expensive to replace. So I was always trying to be very careful about the washing, washer and dryer settings. And like I said, you had to advance the cycle. So there was this like button or switch that you had to hold in. And as you held it in, the cycle would advance, which means that it would speed through the cycle in, I don't know, a minute or two, maybe, instead of 30 minutes. And then you could start a new cycle once it was done advancing. But you had to be standing there pressing it the whole time for it to work. You couldn't, you know, just press the button once and, you know, there's no other way to stop it. So I start advancing the cycle and suddenly I start to smell this unusual smell. It was almost like sulfur is how I would describe it. And that was weird because I had never smelled sulfur before down in the laundry room. And, you know, I spent time down there every week to do my laundry. And just to pause here, because I'm sure at least some listeners are thinking this right now, I will say that while typing out my notes for this, I had to ask myself whether it was possible that I was smelling natural gas. I definitely knew at the time what natural gas smelled like. And I remember... I did not think that it was natural gas at the time. But to be totally honest, I don't know how I would differentiate the rotten egg sulfur smell of natural gas versus a unusual, different sulfur smell. Something about it just smelled different to me, different from natural gas, but I don't know how to explain how. And however, PSA, if you ever smell a rotten egg or sulfur smell indoors, it's way more likely that that is a natural gas leak than something paranormal. So do not assume it's a ghost. If you smell natural gas in a room where you are, get out of there immediately. Don't do anything with anything electronic. Don't even turn lights on or off. Just go outside and call 911 and tell them you think you have a gas leak. Natural gas leaks are extremely dangerous and can cause explosions and fires really easily. So In the interest of being thorough, in case you're wondering, I did look up side effects of exposure to natural gas and also carbon monoxide while I was while I was at it. And there aren't any side effects that I'm seeing related to paranoia or hallucination, etc. Nothing that would really have bearing on this story. I looked it up and common symptoms of natural gas exposure are headache, dizziness, nausea, eye and throat irritation, fatigue, breathing problems, pale skin, or blisters. I wasn't experiencing any of that. And, you know, I have asthma, so I'm usually pretty 
attuned to my breathing and uh, didn't didn't have any of those symptoms. And the symptoms of carbon monoxide poisoning are tiredness, nausea and dizziness, headache, chest or stomach pains, vision problems, loss of muscle control. I wasn't having any of those symptoms either. And also later, you know, like half an hour later, when I went back into the laundry room, I did not smell that smell anymore, which I think if it had been a natural gas leak, I would have still smelled it. So I wanted to make sure to say that both as a disclaimer and also because I'm sure some people were thinking that as soon as I said a sulfur smell. So anyway, to get back to the story, I remember looking over at some of the pipes along the wall and the ceiling, and I was kind of wondering, okay, could the smell be coming from any of those? But I think those pipes were probably just like steam pipes for heating and then water and exhaust for the washers and dryers. So to me, it didn't really make sense for any of that to smell like sulfur. So anyway, as I'm standing there pressing the switch to advance the cycle and looking at the pipes, I suddenly get this strong sense that someone is standing right behind me. And it's that feeling like when someone's standing really close, almost close enough to be pressed against your back, but not quite. I'm pretty familiar with that feeling from the subway, right? Um, So I tried not to panic and I told myself I was just freaking myself out, overactive imagination, et cetera. I looked up at the fisheye mirror and of course, I confirmed that I'm definitely alone in the laundry room. There's no one behind me. But then I started thinking about demon lore, like sulfur and brimstone smells. And I started thinking about creatures like vampires who can't be seen in mirrors. So still pressing the advanced cycle button, I turn around and of course I don't see anything. There's no one there. I turn back around and I face the washing machine, though really I'm just looking at the mirror and watching that at this point. And of course, there's nothing in the mirror. It's just me standing in an empty room. But I'm still feeling that really strong sense of someone standing right behind me. And I look again, and of course, no one's there. And at this point, I was thinking, maybe I should just go upstairs. But then again, I thought about how the washer would probably damage my clothes if I did that. And I told myself, you know, it won't be long. It's a couple minutes tops to advance the cycle. I just need to get through the cycle and restart the machine. But just the whole time, I have this really strong sense of someone standing very close to me, right behind me. And I sort of had this strong mental image of a male entity who was much shorter than me, but who was hovering several feet over the ground so that his face was either level with my shoulders or slightly above that height. And I had this strong sense of this entity's entity's face being distorted by this huge, creepy, and almost gloating smile. And I felt like this entity was just staring at me and smiling like some sort of deranged clown. Now, that could have just been my imagination. I would not blame anyone for just saying that's an overactive imagination. Fine. But I had been intentionally trying not to think about you know, what could be behind me, etc. But that image kept popping into my head. And as far as I'm aware, I don't think it came from any particular piece of media. You know, I don't know where my brain was getting that like very distinct image, but that's what kept popping into my brain. And after what felt like forever, but was no more than a couple minutes, I finished advancing the cycle, I started the machine back on the right setting, and I got out of there. I went back upstairs to my room, and when I returned to the laundry room, you know, half an hour later, to put the wash in the dryer, I didn't smell sulfur at all. So again, another reason why I don't think it was natural gas. But I was obviously still very shaken from the experience, and I felt like I was being watched, but that's not really different from how I felt all the time in that building. and nothing new happened. So again, like if my brain was playing tricks on me or if I was, you know, experiencing an overactive imagination, which is of course possible, it is a little bit weird that, you know, in the time it took to transfer my clothes from the washer to the dryer, I didn't get that sense again, that there was, you know, someone right behind me, et cetera. And, you know, I never felt comfortable in that basement but nothing like that happened to me in the laundry room again. 
I didn't totally know what to make of this experience. At the time, my sense of the paranormal was much less nuanced than it is now. So I kind of jokingly referred to it as a demon when I told other people the story. But I don't really know what this entity was. This story relies a lot on my own feelings about things. So I definitely don't, like I said, blame folks if they disagree with me and think that I didn't didn't experience anything. But my own opinion is definitely that something paranormal was occurring. And it just wasn't an instance where I felt uncertain. Like sometimes I have experiences and I'm like, well, maybe it was paranormal, maybe not. Maybe I was just freaking myself out. No, I, I definitely felt like there was a threatening presence in there with me. And I did feel legitimately afraid. It was not a good experience. But I don't, like I said, I don't really know what to make of that, right? Like the basement was creepy. There's, you know, the cadaver connection. You know, cadavers were stored there. There was the tunnel that had an entrance right near there. But I don't have like an explanation for what I think this may have been kind of like alluding to, right? Because so many hauntings seem to be tied to something that happened in the past, etc. I don't really know what to make of this. One other thing that's maybe worth mentioning is I do know that EMF exposure can sometimes make people feel extremely uncomfortable. And I'm pretty sure I've read that it can kind of mimic some symptoms of like being exposed to paranormal stuff. So I know that EMF is put out by some types of machinery and electronics So that's another possible non-paranormal explanation for perhaps what I was experiencing, though, like I said, I still have a sense that it was paranormal, though I can't prove it. So that was probably the most dramatic experience that happened to me in Finley. Another thing that happened while I was there was my nice roommate, not the creepy one, the nice one, she and I both noticed that we would hear from time to time in different parts of the building what sounded almost like a bell ringing. And we heard it all over the building. We heard it in our room, on the ground floor by the dorm entrance, in the hallways, in the basement. And it wasn't a loud bell, but it always sounded close. And it definitely didn't sound like a ringtone chime or like a radiator banging or anything. It sounded like a fairly thick metal bell being rung. And this always really weirded me out because like I said, it was always the same volume no matter where I was. But say if it was like an elevator chime or a person's ringtone, which I don't think it was, but that's just an example, it should have been louder or quieter depending on how close or far we were away from it. You know, like if someone down the hall has a ringtone or if you're hearing the elevator down the hall, it should get louder as you get closer, etc. So why did we hear this at a consistent volume in different parts of the building, even in our room when it was just us alone and we you know, knew we didn't have that as a ringtone, et cetera? It was just really strange. And I remember I asked around to other people who I knew in the building and I never found anyone aside from me and that one roommate of mine who heard this bell. And I haven't found anything in the dorm's history or the building's history to suggest a reason why I might have been haunted by a phantom bell. But I also haven't thought of a good way to debunk the sound. Because even if, yeah, if a piece of machinery somewhere was making that sound, you know, two pieces of metal hitting each other, it shouldn't have sounded so consistent in so many different parts of the building. Like I remember I heard it in the basement, in the first floor by the lobby, in the hallways, in our room, etc. There's just no reason why that should have happened. And it just, it always really bothered me because I couldn't figure out what the deal was there. So then the third thing that happened was my nice roommate and I started to hear on a regular basis, a really loud noise from outside Finley Hall. I always describe it as a sort of gibbering sound It was extremely loud and echoey. It sounded like a bunch of different voices all crying out at once, like all shouting at once. And it sounded both like kind of voicey, like a person perhaps was making it, 
And it sounded like there was a lot of sort of like emotion in it and fear. And I remember the school was next to the Bronx Zoo. And I remember the first time I heard it, my first thought was like, did a bunch of monkeys escape from the zoo? And are they running through the streets howling? But of course, that's highly unlikely. And I don't think monkeys were that loud or make that exact sound. Like it wasn't a super high sound. And, you know, it was, like I said, kind of voicey. But it was a really troubling sound. Like it was really like kind of chilling to me to hear it. And we asked other people in the building if they could hear it. And like with the bell, everyone we asked said no. And I wish I had written down all the details about when this happened, how often, etc. But I can say that it was a regular occurrence. In my memory, I seem to remember that it was perhaps weekly. But if not weekly, then at least every couple weeks. It happened, I think, at a pretty consistent time at night in the evening, but well before I would have gone to bed. So I assume that must have made it sometime between like 9 and 11 p.m. And, you know, I can't say for sure what time time of day it was, aside from, you know, just in the evening, sometime before I went to bed. And I can't say what day of the week it was either. And I really regret not having notes on this. Now, there may very well be a mundane explanation for this. If you've never lived in that part of the Bronx, you perhaps don't know that the neighborhood is very loud, typically. So when I lived off campus during the summer, when everyone had their windows open, it was normal for me to hear a bunch of different people's radios blaring. And usually it was so loud that there wasn't even a point in me listening to my own music in my room unless I had like noise canceling headphones, which I didn't have, because my music would just be overpowered by the music from outside. It sounds annoying maybe, but it was actually kind of nice, especially in the summer when everyone's outside, hanging out with friends and family, etc. Just felt really wholesome and comforting, but it was loud. And then even while living on campus, I spent a couple years living in some other buildings along a different edge of campus. And it was really normal to hear music blasting from this car repair shop that was just right off campus. And you'd hear, you know, engine noises and, you know, it was not a quiet neighborhood, I would say. So all this to say that it's possible that the sound I heard was noise from off campus. But the thing is, when things were loud, you could usually identify what you were hearing, right? Like you were hearing music from the radio or a noisy car or a preacher at Fordham Plaza with a megaphone, you could always tell what it was that was making the noise. But this didn't sound like anything that I could identify, and it was always so weird to me that I couldn't find anyone else aside from my roommate who heard the noise when it was such a regular occurrence. Because, you know, people usually noticed and remarked upon loud noises you know, in New York, we like to bond by complaining to each other. So the fact that I couldn't find anyone else who recognized this really weird sound just was always strange to me. And, you know, there may be a perfectly reasonable, mundane explanation for this sound, but I haven't been able to identify a debunking that's stronger than like, well, the Bronx is loud sometimes. New York City is loud sometimes. but. To me, and based on my experience living in the neighborhood, like it just didn't sound quite normal to me. And it was just strange that it was so consistent. So I have looked for potentially paranormal explanations. And while I haven't found anything super, super clear, I have found some instances of loud noises that would have happened in the past in the area that had a sort of emotional undertone. You may have heard of residual hauntings before. I've talked about them and I've explained stone tape theory earlier in this series. But you know, there's this idea that things from the past can be recorded into the environment, kind of remembered by a place and replayed in the future. Most of the time, residual hauntings, you know, it's like tied to ghosts, ghosts of the past, inhabitants of an area, leave behind traces of their emotions, their, you know, forms like visual forms or potentially sounds or actions, whatever, to be replayed in the area where it's been recorded. You know, it's just a theory, but I've been thinking 
why wouldn't a noise or screams from the past, especially if they were potentially consistent or emotionally charged, be able to be recorded somewhere, you know, in the stone tape, if that's a real thing, and replayed? It's a long shot, but I found three things that made me pause and think, huh, I wonder if this could be a remnant of one of these things. Two of them are more plausible. The third one's a bit of a wild card. But these things are potential candidates, I think, for something residual that could have been hanging on around the area and which could have been causing the sound we were hearing. So the first one is the primal scream. So this is something that an alum told me about when I was still a student at Fordham. I think it was at a Christmas party for my program where alumni were invited. And I was talking to this guy who had gone to Fordham and had been a student in the 80s. And he said that back then, the primal scream was a tradition on campus. I was like, well, what, what is that? So every Thursday night at 10 p.m., people in a number of dorms, including Finley Hall, would stick their heads out of the window and scream at the top of their lungs. Some of the Jesuit scholastics who lived on campus would also participate. So here's an article from the Fordham Observer, which is Fordham's Manhattan campus's student newspaper from November 17th, 1982. I just want to read a bit from this. On Fordham's uptown campus in the Bronx, the flow of student energy is not always so productive. Instead of politics and human rights, the most popular and organized student movement at Rose Hill is the Thursday night primal scream. At 10 p.m. each Thursday, about one-fourth of the dormitory residents drop what they're doing to crane their necks out their windows and yell themselves silly. The overall effect sounds something like the Bronx Zoo at feeding time. But the happy students have, as they say, quote, a good time. So when I found this passage, I was sort of blown away because, you know, it has some interesting overlaps to what I experienced, right? It was a regular occurrence. It was in that, you know, 9 to 11 p.m. block of time. And then that idea that it sounded like the Bronx Zoo at feeding time, that's just so similar to this image that I got in my head when I would hear it of a bunch of monkeys running down the street. Like there was always something very unhinged about the sound. And it just wasn't a sound that seemed like it belonged in the Bronx, you know, like it just didn't feel right in the neighborhood. So this idea that maybe it's this echo of the primal scream is something that like, to me, I think it's the most likely explanation for this, you know, when looking for a potentially paranormal route to what I was hearing. I also wanted to read from a September 4th, 1983 story in The Ram. Faced with these problems and academic pressures, students initiated a primal scream on Thursday nights at 10 p.m. to relieve their frustrations by yelling simultaneously out dormitory windows. One boarder described the weekly event as, quote, the most extreme form of relief a student can experience after a day of diligent study. It expresses a feeling of solidarity between Fordham students. You might wonder what sort of things students were super upset about. So I wanted to read a little bit more about that article to illustrate some of the challenges that students were facing at the time. For some Rose Hill residents, Fordham was falling apart. Although no one was injured, a ceiling collapse forced the evacuation of the campus's oldest dormitory, St. John's Hall. Sewage backups, elevator failures, a water main break, and a lack of heat and hot water caused problems in others. A steadily deteriorating brick facade on Walsh Hall is forcing the university to bring the building in line with New York City's Local Law Number 10. Maintenance problems seem to contradict administrators' view that Fordham had one of the, quote, most well-maintained campuses in the country, a view put forth in an advertisement on the editorial page of the New York Times entitled Husbandry. They said they'd clean it, said one resident concerning a sewage backup in her bathroom. There are maggots, and it leaked out into the closet. After what we saw, I can't even imagine taking a shower in there. Much of my property has been damaged, said another when a ceiling collapsed in his room. 
The room is full of dust and debris. It has covered books, desks, and shelves. By the middle of the night, it's absolutely freezing, stated a Walsh resident, whose floor did not receive heat in December and January. Problems extended beyond the dormitories also. Between October and April, 18 students were mugged both on and off the Bronx campus at gunpoint, or knife point. Although no one was seriously injured, students wanted to know how campus security had let intruders in its gates, including a mental patient from the Bronx State Hospital who created a commotion on the roof of a Jesuit residence hall. For the record, the story about the sewage backup with the maggots, that was Finley Hall. I found another article talking about it. So obviously things were not super positive on campus and it sounds like students were feeling overwhelmed and powerless and like the only thing they could do to improve the situation or not even improve the situation improve their mental health or like have catharsis for their sounds like very well-founded anxieties and unhappiness the only thing they could do was stick their heads out the window once a week and scream out into the darkness. So that to me, if I were to make a hypothesis about what I was hearing, I think it was the primal scream. However, because I found a couple other interesting things that are, I think, less strong candidates for what residual thing might be kind of haunting that area or might have caused us to hear that sound. I want to talk about these two other things. So the first thing, pretty quick, I found an article from September 22nd, 1972, about the dorm right next to Finley Hall. It's what I saw out my window from Finley Hall. That dorm was called either 555 or Walsh Hall. And the article's about how upon the opening of the dorm, there was an issue with students behaving badly. Students were making noise, throwing stuff out of dorm windows, and creating a real disturbance and disruption that people off campus were being disturbed by and woken up by, etc. So it was so bad that local residents had to stand outside the dorm, which was right at the edge of campus, and at 9.30 a.m. on a Sunday, they stood outside the dorm and banged on garbage cans and other, you know, loud objects to wake up the students and to show them what it was like to be woken up when they were trying to sleep. It sounds like after that, the students got a little quieter. Though to be honest, I didn't do a ton of legwork tracking down the story and seeing what the resolution was, you know, whether there were further escalations or not. But I just think it's notable that there was this historical disturbance which was a really big act of disrespect toward the community and seems like it was totally unnecessary. Like, why did the students need to be so disruptive? So that's that. So then the third candidate for what could have disturbed the vibe around Finley Hall is a long shot, but it's a weird enough story that I just think it's worth going into. So most people, including Fordham students and alumni, don't know that back in the 1960s, there was a experimental college that was founded as part of Fordham. So this experimental college associated with Fordham was called Ben Salem. Coincidentally, it was located just off campus, very close to Finley Hall, very close to the gate next to Finley Hall. It is about a block and a half away from where Finley Hall is. So it's from the direction that I heard the sound from, you know, when I was a student. And just right off the bat, I haven't found a specific report of noise coming from this experimental college back when it existed, but I feel pretty confident that these folks partied a lot and made a lot of noise and got up to some mischief. So just real quick, I want to talk about this really weird experimental college. So in 1965, a poet named Dr. Elizabeth Sewell and the president of Fordham, the Jesuit priest Leo McLaughlin, who was a bit of a maverick, I guess, were at a luncheon together. 
They got to talking and they realized that they were both interested in the idea of a college with no structured education. Very 60s. The idea was to, quote, rethink the whole of education in this day and age from top to bottom. Sewell said she would assemble a faculty, so she did, gathering up a group of her friends, all of whom were under the age of 30. Sounds like they chose the name Ben Salem from Francis Bacon's book New Atlantis, where a bunch of mariners start a society named Ben Salem, I think. So the idea of this college was that the curriculum admission, and many other parts of the college would be all up to the students. The faculty established a single educational requirement. I bet you'll never guess what this one required course was. Everyone had to learn Urdu. That's because one of the faculty members was Pakistani and argued fairly, I would say, that Western literature was overemphasized in Fordham's curriculum And despite there being many great works written in Urdu, they weren't studied by Americans. So that was the one required class or course of study, but Urdu was quickly reduced to a suggestion rather than a requirement. So, you know, I think that in theory, all of this sounds great. You know, students could learn what they wanted. And the plan was that they could study year round for three years rather than having, you know, four years with semesters and summers off, which I think is great. And they would graduate with a degree from Fordham University, despite being part of the experimental part of Fordham University. All they needed to do to graduate was create a portfolio about their experiences and what they learned. And then they had to have a faculty member sign it. And the rule was, if a student came to a faculty member with their portfolio, and asked the faculty member to sign something, the faculty member was required to sign it. So what could go wrong here? So I would argue, you know, aside from some of the red flags that have shown up in what I've just been talking about, I would argue that one misstep was that they decided in a very 1960s way that all the students and faculty should live together I also think it was a problem that the school was self-governed, which in theory is a great idea, but the rule was that everyone in the building where everyone lived together, all the students and faculty, had to come to a consensus for any decision. But it's obviously very hard to get people to agree. And you know, if one person can gum up the works, that's a problem. So the school opened in July, 1967 with 30 students. They all lived in this building just off Fordham's campus at 610 East 191st Street. It's a multifamily four-story walk-up red brick building with 16 units. And like I said, the building is about a block and a half away from Finley Hall. So pretty quickly, it sounds like factions arose. Ben Salem faculty member Gerald Quinn would later say that there were two types of students who were attracted to Ben Salem, those who attempted to learn and live, and those who lived and claimed to learn. It sounds like the physical living conditions deteriorated pretty quickly. People described the building that they were living in as badly maintained. They said that the inside of it was awful, there were mattresses on the floor, etc., To read a quote from a visitor that I found in the book Fordham, A History of the Jesuit University of New York, 1841 to 2003, which I've mentioned a bunch of times in this series, a visitor, when they went to Vin Salem in May 1971, said this, the building could have easily qualified for a slum. It was dark and dingy, needing paint and plaster. There was no common eating space, no classrooms, no seminar area and only a tiny lounge with a few broken pieces of furniture and a vivid arrangement of obscenities on the walls. Furniture in the apartments consisted of bare mattresses usually strewn on the floors. The same book recounts a story of a visitor who was excited to see that students were growing their own tomatoes up on the roof in the garden until he took a closer look and he saw that they were marijuana plants. So, you know... Sounds like things were a little wild at Ben Salem. 
The university hired a professor at a different school to go and assess conditions at the college, and this professor described sitting in the common room on a chair with three legs, and he said that every time he leaned forward to listen to a student, the chair would collapse. And while, you know, all the students and faculty were supposedly living in the same building by 1971, it sounds like many second and third year students lived outside the building, which kind of defeated the purpose of the residential living aspect. The dropout rate was pretty high. Only half the students at Ben Salem actually graduated. Also, students got to choose the next class of students. And the report that said that Ben Salem would close described it as being, quote, like a fraternity house in terms of how new students were chosen. So that sounds bad. There was a really high faculty and director turnover, so it was pretty unstable and there wasn't much continuity in the education there. In the book, Fordham, A History and Memoir, it describes the factions that people split into at Ben Salem. And one of those groups was described as the fascists. So not everyone at Ben Salem was progressive. And at some point, Ben Salem's student body was 30% black students, which I guess the reactionary students in the college were not too happy about. So sounds like there were some racists in this uh, college. Sounds like, you know, it was not a good atmosphere. And there were other unpleasant stories that came out of Ben Salem. There were stories of violence and even death. So there was one instance of a white female student who ended up holding up a store, I think, and she ended up being arrested for that. I, I think that was at gunpoint, though I forgot to write that down. And at one point, a student fell out of a window and died. So, you know, if we're talking about residual hauntings and bad vibes, I think this is an environment that had some very negative influences, some real negligence. And it sounds like there was a lot of partying and stuff. And while I haven't found a specific article that said something like they had really loud parties or they yelled a lot, etc., I wouldn't be surprised if there was a lot of noise coming from this building. So that's one reason why I was kind of like, okay, Ben Salem, it's a weaker candidate for, you know, if the sound is residual, what that residual sound might be caused by. But I don't, I think it's still a candidate for that. So kind of to wrap up, I will say not everything coming out of Ben Salem was bad. The first graduating class in particular got a ton of fellowships and seemed very academically dedicated. And as late as 1970, students were doing community service, like organizing a volunteer daycare center. In 1969, Sewell resigned, saying, I have learned that total freedom can be the most destructive and terrible thing in the world. Father McLaughlin, the university president, resigned around the same time. And with that, the college no longer had allies in the school's administration. So it was shut down in 1974. When the building was vacated, the graffiti on the walls contained a play on the opening line of the movie Love Story, which, by the way, was partially filmed at Fordham, saying, what do you say about a six-year-old college that dies? And another person wrote, a lot of people in this place live their entire lives with the illusion that they are free. So that's been Salem a place of a lot of, I think, unpleasantness and weirdness that was very close to Finlay Hall. So I realized that coming out of this episode, Fordham students don't end up looking super great, right? Like screaming out the window instead of trying to improve material conditions on campus, partying and being disruptive to local residents, starting a student-directed school that then a fascist faction grows up out of. And of course, you know, I started out talking about homophobia and, you know, slurs being written on queer students' doors as recently as 2016. And I wish I could say that I was giving you a unfairly unpleasant view of the Fordham student body. But I don't think I can say that. There were a lot of great people who I knew at Fordham, and there was a lot of bad stuff going on there. And I am going to end up probably closing this series talking about 
some of the reasons why I think Fordham might have so much negativity and so many hauntings associated with it. And, you know, part of it is there's rightfully some very bad vibes because of how people behave and think and some of the bigotry, disrespect, etc. that people have. And, you know, of course, like I said, it's not all students. It's probably not even a majority of students. But when you are in a space like that, it doesn't have to be the majority for you to feel really, really bad. So I'm sure that all of that contributed to my feelings of unsafety and just general unpleasantness while in Finley Hall. So that's it for Finley Hall. Next time I am going to spin through some of the less haunted dorms, but, you know, dorms that still have stories of hauntings. And in the meantime, you can check out all of my sources for this episode in the series at buriedsecretspodcast.com. You can follow me on Instagram at buriedsecretspodcast. I have been posting, you know, some historic photos of Fordham and also some pictures that I took back when I was a student. And if you enjoyed this podcast, please rate and review on your podcatcher of choice. Please tell your friends about it. That would really help other people find the podcast. And thanks so much for listening.